In 1999, a minister's wife was found dead in an overflowing bathtub in her home in South Dakota. Her cryptic suicide note left questions about her state of mind and her sense of time. Forensic science provided those answers. This peaceful house of God is the United Presbyterian Church. Each Sunday morning, it opens its doors to the faithful of Woolsey, South Dakota. The town is no more than a handful of dirt roads just off Highway 14, and several farms out on the blustery prairie. The pastor of this congregation was Reverend Bill Guthrie. He and his wife, Sharon, lived in the parsonage next door to the church. He was a very strong minister, probably the most intelligent man when it came to the Bible. Sharon Guthrie also helped her husband with church duties. She did children's message. It was before the sermon. Tell him a story and, and send him with a package of Smarties to go back and sit down, a little candy Smarties. The Guthries were looking forward to the wedding of their second daughter, Jenna Lou. But Sharon Guthrie would never see that day. Just after dawn on May 14, 1999, Reverend Guthrie called an ambulance. He had discovered his wife unconscious in the bathtub. Oh, she's had an accident. When emergency personnel arrived, they performed CPR and restarted her heart. In the ambulance, she was placed on a respirator, but she never regained consciousness. Despite the best medical care in the area, emergency room doctors could find no signs of brain activity. We all decided at that point that it just was time to let her go. The next day, Sharon Guthrie was pronounced dead. When the sheriff asked Reverend Guthrie about the incident, he said his wife was fine when he left home to go to the church to say his daily prayers. When he was leaving the house to go to the church, his wife was drawing her bath water and was getting ready to take a bath. He said he went to the church, uh, was there maybe 10 minutes, came back to the house. Guthrie said he found his wife face down in the overflowing bathtub. Guthrie said he tried to pull her body out of the tub, but was unsuccessful. All he could do was empty the tub and turn her body over before calling the ambulance. We just figured we were dealing with some sort of a, an accident, you know, where this lady had had a seizure or heart attack or something while she was taking a bath. Dr. Brad Randall performed the autopsy and found no signs of trauma or illness. Fortunately, the emergency room personnel had taken blood samples when she was first brought to the hospital, which the pathologist could analyze. So we had samples from a living individual rather than a dead individual, which toxicology in dead people is a little more difficult than working with an actual living individual. So we were lucky to have those samples to work with. The samples revealed three medications in Sharon's system. Two were medications she had been prescribed and were in relatively low concentrations. But there was one drug in her system she had not been prescribed. The most important drug was a drug called temazepam, which is a benzodiazepine that was present in very high concentrations. It is a drug not commonly associated with lethal overdoses. Temazepam is a sedative. The level in Sharon Guthrie's system would definitely render someone unconscious. 
although Randall could not be certain how many capsules were taken. Probably greater than five to 10, somewhere in that category or more. Dr. Randall listed the cause of death as drowning, with the temazepam overdose a contributing factor. The manner of death was undetermined. Was it suicide? Or could it have been murder? Three weeks after Sharon Guthrie's death, her daughter, Jana Lou, decided to go ahead with her wedding as planned. I talked to my dad about it. I talked to family about it, asked to what they thought we should do. And I talked to my husband about it. And we decided that my mom would have wanted us to do it. My dad actually performed the ceremony. Meanwhile, Detective Jerry Lindbergh was assigned to investigate Sharon Guthrie's death. Unfortunately, the scene of the drowning had not been preserved for evaluation. The result of her being alive and taken to a hospital out of town, the place was left open. A lot of the evidence was destroyed because people came in, the good neighbor thing, cleaned up, brought lunches, and so on. But investigators discovered the source of the temazepam in Sharon's system. It had been prescribed for her husband, Bill. Bill Guthrie suspected his wife had accidentally ingested the pills while sleepwalking. But none of her three daughters recall Sharon ever sleepwalking. And investigators found something suspicious. A few weeks before Sharon's death, Bill Guthrie filled his original prescription for temazepam at one pharmacy and then went to a second pharmacy, told them he had lost his first prescription and got a second one. Another inconsistency was Bill's clothing on the morning of Sharon's death. Bill told the sheriff he had tried to lift his wife out of the bathtub when he first found her. Yet, witnesses said that his clothing was completely dry when the ambulance crew arrived. He was dry. If you spend any time at all wrestling around with, with a wet individual, you're going to get wet. And investigators learned the pastor had some secrets. A girlfriend in Nebraska, in fact, had been town gossip just before they'd left the community and came to Woolsey. Probably part of the reason he came up here is because of that. I knew her from when they were at their previous church. I knew my mom didn't like her, but I never really knew why. Guthrie's mistress was a leading member of his former church in Nebraska. The affair continued even after Guthrie moved to South Dakota. <laughs> when Guthrie took the job in Woolsey, he told the church council that he needed to return to Nebraska for medical counseling because he was impotent. I think on some occasions they even paid his mileage. And he never went to counseling. He was going back to continue this affair. With but eventually, Guthrie's mistress grew dissatisfied with their clandestine affair. Basically, she, and these are her words, that all they would do is have sex. And he would stay in the motel room. They couldn't go out to eat, couldn't go to a movie. And she was tired of that. And she wanted something more. So she put some pressure on him, and he never did anything. And then finally, in January, she broke up with him. And there was no evidence that Bill Guthrie was impotent. Not from what his girlfriend told us. Apparently, he was able to perform adequately and, and uh, did on frequent occasions. Investigators now considered Bill Guthrie a suspect in his wife's death. But adultery and prescription fraud is one thing, but murder is another. Police enlisted Bill's oldest daughter, Suzanne, to find out if her father played a role in her mother's death. She agreed to confront her father with a hidden microphone. I thought maybe I could plead as a daughter, you know, um, for him to just be honest with me. I need to know some answers. OK, ask. You had an affair. No. Where did you hear that? I've heard it from everybody, Dad. They have a lot on you, Dad. And I need to know 
the truth in all of this. I'm on your side. I don't want to think that you've done the things that you've done. What do you think that I did? They think you did, Mom. There's medicine missing. I don't know anything about medicine that's missing. And he still totally denied um, everything from his affair to getting the medication. In late July, investigators confiscated the church computer in order to see the email correspondence between the pastor and his lover in Nebraska. The emails revealed nothing. But police wondered if there was information hidden somewhere on the computer's hard drive. To find out, they turned to an expert in the new field of computer forensics. After Sharon Guthrie's suspicious drowning, police confiscated the Guthrie's computer to see if it contained possible evidence. Judd Robbins is an expert in the field of computer forensics. He says that most of us know very little about how computers really work. The most common misconception is that you can delete data by asking your program or your operating system to delete it and that it's gone. It isn't. That's because hitting the delete key simply marks that material and the memory it uses as available for use in the future. There is residual traces of their existence in that space. And so the equivalent in a computer system is that there is often a residual indication that you were there. It's now trace. Evidentiary value is, is tremendous if it's found before the space gets re-rented or released or in the computer reused by a new file. The computer information trail may also show when files are created, downloaded, or edited. Robbins use special software to search the memory for anything related to Tamazepam. He discovered there had been numerous internet searches about sleeping pills just a month before Sharon died. Someone had also downloaded numerous articles about Tamazepam, which had been found in Sharon's system. Tamazepam is the only sleeping pill that comes in the capsule form that you can take apart and it has powder inside, so it's easy to take apart and put it into something. And Robbins found other information on the hard drive that he thought might be of value. I didn't know exactly how it when she died, so I called Mike Moore and asked. And I said, why? And he goes, well, there seems to be a lot of information in here on bathtub accidents. And I then told him that she drowned in a bathtub. The searches were done the month before Sharon died, with the last one completed on April 27th. The searches were done in April, and she died in May. On April 29th, Guthrie asked his doctor for a prescription for Tamazepam and filled it at the two different pharmacies. The prescription was filled again on May 12th and 13th. On May 14th, a heavily drugged Sharon Guthrie drowned in her tub. Based on the computer evidence, Bill Guthrie was arrested and charged with murder. The prosecution theorized that Guthrie wanted out of his marriage, but feared a divorce would jeopardize his position as a pastor. So he looked for ways to make her death look like an accident. And the way he may have done it was to lace her favorite drink, chocolate milk, with an overdose of sedatives. She drank it every day. That was just her thing. Um, she just always drank chocolate milk. She loved chocolate milk. Prosecutors believe that on the morning of her death, Bill Guthrie put the tamazepam in his wife's chocolate milk, then gave it to her in bed before going to the church. After the drugs went into effect, he placed his wife, now unconscious, into the tub, filled it with water, and let her drown.
I felt we had a pretty good circumstantial case, but all our evidence was circumstantial. But Jenna Lou Simpson still wasn't convinced that her father was a murderer. She says her mother took an overdose of Benadryl, an allergy medication, a few weeks earlier and required medical attention. I thought it was accidental. I thought that she had done it before with the Benadryl. She had done it before with some herbal stuff. I thought she probably, you know, did it again just to just get some attention. People who filled church pews to hear Bill Guthrie preach now filled the wooden benches of the Beetle County Courthouse. It was packed every day. People get here sometimes at 7 o'clock in the morning so they'd get a seat. Prosecutor Mike Moore was confident of his case. Then Moore got the shock of his life. The defense introduced a suicide note from Sharon Guthrie. At his murder trial, Bill Guthrie revealed that several weeks after her death, he found a suicide note from his wife, Sharon. For some unexplained reason, it was hidden in a liturgy book in the church office. Well, a bunch of things raised through your head. You know, you're upset, you're shocked. The note was typed on a computer, but was unsigned. It was dated May 13th, 1999, the day before Sharon died and addressed to her daughter. Dear Suzanne, I am sorry I ruined your wedding. Your dad told me about your concerns of my interfering in Jenna Luz and the possibility I might ruin hers. I won't be there, so put your mind at ease. You will understand after the wedding is done. I love you all, Mom. The note referred to a minor incident that occurred at Suzanne's wedding a few years earlier. Prosecutor Mike Moore asked his computer forensic expert, Judd Robbins, to re-examine the hard drive of the church's computer to see if he could find any trace of the suicide note. But he found none. Fingerprint expert Cindy Orton analyzed the note, spraying it with the chemical ninhydrin. If an individual writes a suicide note and they are truly contemplating suicide, they have a tendency to perspire. Using the anhydrin is a good reagent because it does look for amino acids, which comes from sweat. Steam from a household iron accelerated the process, revealing numerous fingerprints. Somebody was perspiring quite heavily while they were handling that document. For what reason, I don't know. Bill Guthrie said he had given the note directly to his lawyer, but the prints on the note did not match either Guthrie or his attorney. It was impossible to tell whether the prints were Sharon's, since she had never been fingerprinted even at her autopsy. But if the note was typed on a computer, and it didn't come from the computer in the church, where did it come from? Police discovered that Guthrie owned a second computer, which he had given to his daughter and son-in-law shortly before his trial. They now turned it over to the state's attorney. The only thing we really wanted was the truth, to know exactly what happened, uh, whether it be proven his innocence or proven his guilt, was, that was up to them. Judd Robbins examined the hard drive from this second computer. On it, Robbins discovered a document file entitled Sharon. The main text was missing, but it had the same closing line as the suicide note and had the same date, May 13th. Both documents had the same typographical error, no space between the comma and the year. So we had margins the same, we had fonts the same, we had words the same. The file had been created in August, three months after Sharon died. Robbins also found evidence that the note was written by Bill Guthrie. This suicide note was constructed in an interspliced, intertwined fashion with several of his sermons in the month of August. 
so that I could construct a timeline of working on sermon, working on suicide note, working on sermon. I think at that point it made me realize that he had done something, that he had done this, and that he was guilty for this. I thought the jury would see what I was seeing, that this was this guy's last ditch effort to get away with killing his wife, and we caught him at it. The jury convicted William Guthrie of first degree murder. He was sentenced to life in prison. After the trial, Sharon Guthrie's body was exhumed so that she could be reburied in her native Nebraska. Sharon's fingerprints were finally obtained. Cynthia Orton compared Sharon's prints to those on the suicide note. They did not match. Well, the question that leaves me with is whose fingerprints are on that document? For now, that question remains a mystery. Daughter Suzanne believes her father is guilty but despite the computer forensic evidence, her sister Jenna Lou believes her father is innocent and stays in contact with him through phone calls and letters. I've lost my mother, my father, and my sisters throughout all this. And I lost them all within a year. The sisters no longer speak. The prosecutor says forensic science solved this case. Without it, he says Bill Guthrie would be a free man. Without those sciences, you don't have a case. If you don't have the pathologist finding drugs, if you don't have the computer expert finding that stuff on the computer, you don't have a case.